Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, special live bonus extra edition of the Reason Roundtable uh, podcast, your otherwise normally uh, weekly uh, podcast from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am uh, Matt Welch, joined by, in the far corner, uh, the tassel-wearing Nick Gillespie, uh, the alcoholic, beardy uh, Peter Suderman, (laughs) and the... Technically perfect in every single respect. There it is. My direct boss, Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, everyone. That's right. Howdy. Happy Saturday. (laughs) It is Saturday, right? I should send around notes about Monday at some point, right? That's going to be... uh, That would be ideal. Yeah. uh, Maybe. Um, So anyways, we're going to, because this is a bonus episode, we're going to talk just a tiny little bit about... uh, uh, news and then the rest of it is going to be uh, what uh, Dr. Jeff Singer reminded me. Oops, did I say that out loud? Uh, reminded me is uh, evergreen story stories that might uh, be able to last a little bit longer. But the topical news that I thought was of interest to just at least go around uh, a little bit uh, around the table is that on Tuesday, uh, President uh, Joseph Robinette Biden the second announced that he was going to be. Uh, doing all kinds of new uh, tariffs on uh, the red uh, Chinese. I think he's doubling uh, the tariffs on semiconductors. He's tripling them on uh, EV batteries. And I know exactly what EV stands for. Uh, And he's quadrupling them on the actual little uh, batteries themselves. This is a little bit at odds with what uh, candidate Joe Biden said that he was going to do back in 2019 or so. Catherine, um, your uh, magazine, uh, Reason Magazine, had a, a story uh, with a headline, Biden's tariffs are a bad idea. And yet I note that the president of the United States says that he is uh, uh, keeping the backs of the American worker. So my question to you, just to start things off, is why does Reason hate the American worker? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we obviously do. And, uh, and you finally called me out. Thank God you're holding, holding me accountable. Thank you, Matt. Um, Yeah, I mean, there is somebody who was really right about tariffs on China, and that person was Joe Biden in 2020 when he said that we're going after China in the wrong way and noted correctly that tariffs are costs on American consumers. And it's funny how when the elections come up, people start changing their minds. And I guess that we are in a moment politically where pretty much everyone wants to impose new tariffs. And um, it's it's going to go exactly as Joe Biden predicted in 2020. It is not going to go well. Um, The list of stuff from China that the tariffs are being imposed on, it's it's EVs, it's semiconductors, it's port equipment, it's medical equipment. Like, can you think of any time in recent history when we really, really needed supplies of all of those things to be available? No, like not like COVID or anything like that. No. You know, it's a disaster. It's always a disaster. It's unfortunate that it's now a bipartisan disaster. Nick, I was uh, thinking about our marvelous uh, uh, panel uh, and discussion that you had with Todd Rose uh, talking about sort of preference falsifications. Is is it possible that we're in a preference falsification when it comes to trade politics in this country, which is to say that because the loudest people of a minority are saying, oh, God, yeah, we definitely need to like protect the American worker by... Uh, tariffing the red Chinese, that definitely that's a majoritarian yeah, position. Protect industries that don't exist here anymore. Right. Uh, it's, I, I think it's uh, really deeply disturbing when you go back 20 or 30 years, and it seemed like the the I, the case for free trade had been made pretty effectively, uh, and that there were gains on both sides from trading. Um, and that, you know, if, if you look at polls, and almost every poll will show that most Americans, are, you know, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent, We'll say that free trade is good or trade is good, um, but there's no question that the leadership of both of the major parties of the duopoly are now like officially anti-trade uh, and certainly anti-free trade. And I think for libertarians, that represents both a failure and an opportunity because what, what has happened that we are not convincing people that actually getting cheaper goods that we don't produce here or don't want to produce here from countries that make money by selling them to us, you know, what we need to make that case more fully. Peter, this morning, uh, I walked in a little bit late uh, to your morning presentation. I apologize for that. But I saw that there's a really bad looking graph. You've heard it. Um, It was (laughs) it was going like this. 
Uh, yeah. and I'm making finger gestures for those listening on audio. And then it did like that at the end. And that seemed real bad. And that's happening soon in terms of the debt and deficit. Uh, and you also pay attention to inflation. Do you care to talk a little bit about how um, stuff like this will affect your graphs. Yeah, this is going to make everything more expensive. It is pretty remarkable that a couple of years ago in 2022, Joe Biden published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal of all places saying that inflation was going to be his number one political priority and that bringing down inflation was going to be the thing not, that he not created. Yeah, yeah, right. This is the inflation, to be clear, that was 9% when he took office, yes. uh, and, according and also, to Joe Biden also recently. Also that he's claiming that he, that he fixed, because now just this last week or so, Biden said, you know, inflation was 9% when I came into office. Again, uh, we went over this earlier this morning, but it was 1.4% when he came into office. It became 9% after that. This is going to make everything more expensive. And it's in particular, it is going to make things more expensive that Joe Biden really wants you to buy, like electric vehicles. So one of Joe Biden's other policy priorities is getting people to buy EVs. He's, he's made a, like a commitment to having, a, what, 50% or something of vehicles on the roads uh, be EVs within the next uh, some number of years. This is a big part of the Biden policy agenda. It's a sort of an environmental goal. And what has he done here? He has raised tariffs on basically all the, the components that are part that are, go into making EVs. And then he's also added a huge hike on EVs themselves that come from China. That's going to make them totally unaffordable. They're already pretty expensive, but that's going to make them totally unaffordable for average people. And so Joe Biden is saying, on the one hand, inflation is my biggest priority. Uh, fighting inflation is my biggest priority. But it turns out that it's not fighting inflation that is his biggest priority. It's raising and causing inflation. He's also definitely going to talk a bunch of smack when Elon Musk raises the price of Teslas. And it's like, that's on you, boo. <laughs> yeah. There's a great uh, there's a great little bit from the White House statement on the tariff announcement where he goes after Trump for Trump's tra Trump's uh, China trade policies failed to, to increase American exports or boost American manufacturing. My dude, you are doing the same thing. Why would you expect a different result? The same thing is going to happen here. These policies are also going to fail in the same way. It's really it's the, the politics of this are, are, are pretty astounding because this is Trump stolen valor from a guy who claims to hate Donald Trump. Uh, Nick, is there some steel man thing that we can do to steal tariffs and China tariffs um, along the lines of like, it's actually not that much like like we're not talking about a lot. We're talking about like electrical batteries. Right. Um, and you can get them this, anywhere. This is just a bone that you throw. Um, and it's also against a, a legitimately authoritarian uh, government. Yeah, that um, has most favored nation status. So I mean, shouldn't. that kind of I mean, the uh, one of the key terms here, Matt, is that we're talking about China. And, uh, you know, when Peter was talking, I kept hearing Trump. Remember when he would say China, 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 that is That's all three syllables. This is politics, but it really does have bad, you know, uh, bad ramifications throughout the economy because we're not going to immediately start doing chip processing. We're not going to start making electric uh, batteries and things like that. And, you know, this is the great breakthrough or one of the great breakthroughs of the past 400 years is, you know, uh, a division of labor and comparative advantage of countries. Like we, we should be leaning into that more also as a way not to make us a vassal state of China, which is, you know, is, I was gonna say was dumb enough to buy so much of our debt, but actually was smart enough to stop doing that many years ago. Um, but, you know, trade relations would be better than what is going to be going on here. But you are, I mean, you are right, it's not that much steel. Like it is kind of some amount of kabuki. We, we only buy like 500,000 tons of steel from China or something like that, which I recognize the phrase only 500,000 tons sounds stupid, but it's like 2% or something of the total import. So it's not that much steel. We're just throwing a little temper tantrum. But even even in the ways that it is that this is small, so uh, currently only about one percent of EVs come from China. It's not a big market here in the United States right now. But what what these tariffs do is they ensure that it will never be a big market, at least as long as those tariffs are in effect. And it is it is it is making a, a situation where it's not 
there's no growth that's going to be possible because the tariffs are so high and, and there's just those those vehicles are not going to be um, are not going to be sold in the United States. For but it's, and it's all the components, right? I mean, if you just raise the price on everything that gets built here, the prices of stuff built here will go up. And it's, you know, uh, Biden says that he does this for the American worker. But when he does things for the American worker, that's a pretty small group of people who build vehicles, even if it's a large part of Biden's voting base. And, you know, at the top of his mind, Biden should be caring about American consumers. That's everyone. And with these tariffs, Biden is saying, I don't care about what you want and what you need and what's good for you. All right. Let's make a hard uh, pivot to some of the kind of uh, circus show atmosphere that we've been seeing in lower Manhattan, uh, by which I mean, yes, uh, the Donald Trump trial and the heavy breathing press coverage of it. But what I really mean is all of the Republicans showing up in red ties uh, directly outside. Uh, Mitt Romney um, uh, told his annual funny joke um, uh, this week. On I'm so proud of him. MSNBC. When he, was, when he said, like, uh, it's it's a, a little bit disheartening to see all these people going outside Manhattan courtroom in red ties auditioning for the uh, the vice presidency. Uh, totally. There's there's pictures. I, I thought that he was just uh, uh, being semi funny. No, like Doug Burgum is wearing the red tie and Vivek is wearing a red tie. Uh, so anyways, what, jumpsuits would have been better. <laughs> I mean, a little orange. Everyone uh, looks good. Solidarity. In orange. Yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit, uh, especially since we are here in Boston, Massachusetts, where John Adams is from, right? The first vice president of the United States of America, I think, uh, was from right here. Uh, let's talk about the Veep stakes uh, in the Republican Party first. I think we have some idea of who's going to win the Democratic Party uh, nomination for vice president, or maybe that's a little bit up in the air. Um, we do, when we have these extra episodes or live episodes, we kind of have this uh, tradition of talking about why fill in the blank, usually presidential uh, candidate is terrible um, because, of course, all politicians are terrible. So let's uh, talk about um, how some of these vice presidential candidates are in their own way terrible while also holding up the possibility that uh, maybe they have some good bits, too, that are worth talking about. Um, but there's uh, like a four or five or six uh, here. We'll, we'll do four because there's four of us. Catherine, uh, you're a lady. Um, so uh, Elise Stefanik uh, is on the uh, short list. She's on the short bus of the Donald Trump <laughs> uh, thing. Why is she terrible or interesting or good? I want to take this opportunity to come out as non-binary, Matt, just it's so you will late. stop throwing you're a lady to me during it's, these podcasts. It's look. Uh, Although maybe then that means I just have to talk about everyone. Like, I don't know that that gets me. No. All not. right. I'm a lady. Do you want to talk about Vivek? No, I yeah. don't. All right. I'm a lady. So let's talk about Elise. Um, I actually have sort of like a, I had like this dim memory of like maybe thinking that she wasn't terrible back in the day, right? I mean, there was this this moment when she first emerged on the scene where it was like, okay, she's kind of moderate. Maybe, you know, she seems like the semi-normal-ish gal. I think she's about my age. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, so I was like, all right, let me just check in. Let me check in on some ratings. Let me see what's going on. Um, the Club for Growth gave her a 35% rating, which actually puts her lower than Ilhan Omar. <laughs> so she's good? I don't know anymore, honestly. But that, yeah, that does not strike me as like a, a great sign. I mean, Liz Cheney, who she um, she replaced in her current role, had like a 65% from Club for Growth. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think if she is being considered, she is being considered for two reasons. One, she's obviously very, very loyal to Trump and has demonstrated that over and over, voting against his impeachments and other things. Um, and the other thing is um, she maybe looks right for VP. Like Trump, I think the kind of general consensus is that he, um, you know, prefers men who look like cartoon presidents to be on his cabinet. Or like pretty ladies, and she's she's like the a, she's too. a pretty yeah. lady. Uh, she likes he likes generals too. Um, but yeah, that that thirty five percent rate. I'm not saying club for growth is my be all and end all of like who should be in charge of the nation, but that the thirty five percent does feel like a deal she breaker. Did like sucker punch the college presidents pretty good. She did. So like props to her for that moment, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, I think that um, that has that's the other reason she's on the short list now is because she did she did score like a. 
I was going to say she scored a clean hit, but I don't know how to do sports metaphors. And I don't know if yours is right or mine is right. Could you trust me, honestly? No, no. Um, uh, they deserve that. And, uh, and so uh, fair play to her on that one. Uh, Nick, uh, you used to live in Ohio uh, and are a doctor of uh, literature. Uh, J.D. Vance, the, um, the acclaimed the hillbilly author, uh, senator. The from, hillbilly uh, senator, hillbilly yeah. ideology, um, is out there like leading the Red Tie Brigade down in lower Manhattan. Uh, why is he terrible or maybe why is he awesome? Uh, he's terrible, and <laughs> he is one of the front men for a kind of form of national conservatism, which... Uh, on economic policies is terrible. Um, he said a couple good things about foreign policy, although always in the most kind of brutally ugly way possible, where he seems not to care about anybody. Um, but uh, he's bad on economic policy. And he also, I think, what's most worrying to me about him in a lot of ways is the complete reversal of who he was when he rose to prominence versus who he is now. So this is a person who, uh, if you haven't read Hillbilly Elegy from 2016, it's, it's a very affecting memoir of, a, uh, uh, of his partial youth spent in a place called Middletown, Ohio, which is in southwestern Ohio. I actually lived a few miles from there. And it is one of the great Rust Belt, you know, sore spots in, in the landscape. And he wrote about the, the people who were left there and their responsibility for their predicament, apart from larger things. And he has, uh, at one point he wrote uh, that we hillbillies have got to wake the hell up. He was talking about personal uplift and taking responsibility. And in Hillbilly Elegy, and this talks about like how he has become a, uh, just a massive political animal, he actually talked about the time when uh, Kawasaki, a Japanese steel company, bought Armco, which was the remains of the steel plant in Middletown, and he realized it was a good thing. He said it was a good thing. You know, now uh, when Nippon Steel uh, talked about buying U.S. Steel, which is kind of the remnant of part of the steel industry here, he talked about it as the second coming of World War II. Um, and he, that is everything about him. And he talks uh, now in terms of saying things like we need to be, and this is a quote, we need to be really ruthless when it comes to wielding the wielding of power. And he's talking about we, he's talking about conservatives, not just on an economic level, but also on a social level and a kind of cultural level. And it's despairing to see somebody who was so sensitive and attuned to a harmed part of the country and figuring out a way to get it moving forward to just becoming the worst kind of bully, uh, you know, with with the possibility of power behind him. Uh, Peter, you're from Florida. Uh, I'm shocked still to read that um, little Marco Rubio is still in the short list. I can't help but think this is just a course he's on the short list. Yeah. This is, uh, wow. and you guys were like on that one. Yeah, you were Matt. ready to go. Matt is just lobbing the uh, softballs. Uh, yeah. So wait, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it means he scored a goal. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so the way I think about Marco Rubio is like everybody has a friend who is constantly hopping on some trendy new bandwagon something or other, right? So like in the 1980s, they were into California wine and fondue. And then they got into craft beer and organic food. And after that, it was like bourbon and hot chicken. And now they're really into craft cocktails and Japanese street food. And it's, it's fine, right? Like you're like, oh, this person's still my friend. But like it's also a little bit desperate. There's something kind of pathetic about it, right? They've probably changed their, like, their, their clothing just you know, along with all of this, right? They're, they're always wearing the new thing. And that's Marco Rubio, except... Instead of food or clothing, it's for the Republican political zeitgeist, right? So go back to 2010 when Marco Rubio was a new senator. There was a New York Times profile of him. I just want to read the headline. It was titled, The First Senator from the Tea Party. And it was all about how Marco Rubio was the exemplar of the Tea Party. All, that's, that was the thing he, was, he had come to Washington to do, was be the Tea Party guy in the Senate. Well, five years later, 
The New Yorker publishes a, a different story. This is all going to be New York-based publications, I guess. Uh, the, this is a different story, and it's about a different group of up-and-coming outsider Republicans called the Reformacons. You may not remember these folks, but they had this idea that, you know, maybe Republicans should kind of get into public policy and think about it a little bit. And, you know, they, they, prior, they prioritized health care in ways that I think were, uh, in, that were good uh, often. Um, they were particularly focused on entitlement reform. I didn't agree with all of their ideas, but actually the, the fact that they were, like, that they were focused on ideas was a big deal. And now you have, now you have Rubio, who is vying for the VP slot uh, on Trump's ticket, publishing op-eds in the Washington Post with titles like, Why I Believe in Industrial Policy, Done Right. And so every time you have a shift in the GOP zeitgeist, you have Marco Rubio at the center of it. And so in some ways, I think, you know, the. Marco Rubio's bid here, it's a little bit weird just because, because of his background, right? The, the policy aspects of it, right? Like, is, is Trump, who has made, we're not going to cut entitlements, a central part of his campaign? Is he going to have a, a vice president who has a history of saying, you know, actually, maybe Medicare needs reform and we need to think about public policy in, in smart and rigorous ways? Is he going to do that? And there's also the personal stuff. You know, I, I was going to lead with a, a boots joke because little Marco, right? And that seemed a little bit unfair, but if you look at the arc of Marco Rubio's history, it is pretty clear that he will do or adopt just about any movement or idea in the Republican Party that will give him a little lift. Oh. Let that, that roll jokes. through the room. Yeah. That jokes. Um, one person I'll take, um, and not because I find him terrible, but precisely because I don't, uh, is uh, Tim Scott, Senator from one of those Carolinas. I think it's the South one. Um, and so Eastern uh, Carolina, Eastern Carolina, <laughs> um, who like when he was running for president, um, he was like the one guy like, oh, he seems nice. I like, he seems like a nice guy, you know, like you would talk about Ronald oh, Reagan standards fallen so low. It, they have, they have, yeah. um, it, it kind of it meant something, but also he was working on some issues uh, that are near and dear to people in this room. He was working on educational choice in a pretty real way. He's working on uh, reforming qualified immunity for police in a really real way that not every Republican necessarily does. Um, and also it just also seemed really nice. And, uh, and people would try to uh, bait him into saying something mean about this politician or that, and he kind of wouldn't do it. Um, and then uh, he dropped out and endorsed Donald Trump. And I don't know if you remember any of the press conference. It was absolutely excruciating because Donald Trump had him on stage and he just sort of like kept pointing back and it's like uh you love me right um to tim scott over and over again and like making weird comments about like he doesn't he's not married and like it was just strange and then um and then uh tim scott at some point said i just love you man um and like it's this extended humiliation or ritual that happens in different ways to marco rubio and to other people i don't necessarily like affix the blame on Donald Trump, although he's a prime mover to that, but it's his popularity. Uh, his, you know, someone uh, was asking recently, like, what is the through line of the ideology of Donald Trump? There's a couple of things that stay uh, true throughout the years. He's always been um, kind of hostile to free trade. He's always been about protecting Social Security. So those are those are consistent as he's gone through this party and that and the other. Um, but in a lot of the other things, um, you know, if you're trying to imagine what the ideology of the current Republican Party is, it is that Donald Trump is popular and they want to stay elect in elected office. And so they sort of find what he's doing and follow it and in the process, invariably humiliate themselves. And so uh, I don't want Tim Scott to run for vice president because I think that he's kind of nice and I don't want him to uh, humiliate himself. Um, which he's going to do. And he already he already has, uh, you know, uh, on January 7th or whatever in 2021, he said Donald Trump lost the election and he's acting bad. Um, and this is a bad moment for American democracy, just kind of full stop. Um, and now when he's being pressed on it in interviews as someone who's running for vice president, they're like, hey, would you have certified the election? He's like, I'm not I'm talking about the future. Um, and uh, would you uh, would you certify? Do you think the 2024 election is going to be fair? You know, it's just uh, I, Donald Trump's going to win. So we don't really need to go there. Um, so he's acting in a way that is uh, so much more cowardly than he did 
Um, not that it was particularly brave. He was just sort of calling the sky blue on January 7th, but he's already signaling that he's willing to debase himself. And too many politicians everywhere, Peter Meyer, who just uh, dropped out of the race for the Senate in Michigan, and Justin Amash is running for this open uh, seat. Uh, and uh, I am rooting for Justin Amash in that race, to be clear, um, now that Peter Meyer's gone. But I know Peter Meyer a little bit. And I what I had told him when he dropped out was like, congratulations. Like, uh, I don't want people I like involved in politics uh, anymore, really, because especially uh, in certain types of politics on the national level, it is a self-debasement program. There aren't many decent people uh, in there, in my estimation, but the ones who are are going to make themselves look bad. Um, speaking of looking bad, uh, Kamala Harris is still <laughs> the vice president. <laughs> at last I checked, she just uh, this week it was probably escaped our attention because we've been busy here at Recent Weekend. Um, but she has announced that she's uh, ready to accept a vice presidential debate. So we have that to look forward to as well. Ooh. I don't know who she's going to be debating. Uh, RFK Jr. has a very colorful vice president. I'd like to see her in a uh, in a debate, as does Cornell West. Um, uh, just go Google that. It's pretty fun. Um, but uh, Kamala Harris, who um, might be the single uh, most difficult to understand politician in American politics because you have no idea what she's saying. She's just nodding her head a lot and smiling and saying word salads. I Googled uh, Kamala Harris and word salad uh, before tonight. And oh, my God, it links to five trillion different public it's comments. Like a, from it's Kamala like Harris. the sizzler in there. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So uh, Catherine, as the editor, reason. Um, we had a uh, cover story back in the long ago days when she was, yes, covers. We have covers still at Reason Magazine. Um, uh, but in long ago, long ago days when she was running for president and before she became a vice presidential candidate, um, Kamala Harris's cop, which she was in, in California, one of the worst. Um, is she still a cop? Yeah, so she's kind of tried to rebrand as like Mamala, like she's okay. she's like our friend and our mom. But I'm here to say, first of all, like all moms are cops. <laughs> <laughs> like, so all moms are bastards. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, a a a m a b. Yeah, and it's it's you know this is uh, I think this is something that she has genuinely has some mixed feelings about because it's it's clear that in her heart she is a cop like she talks about her time as a prosecutor as a as a cop uh in a way that uh you know those are some of her real accomplishments in her life and uh elizabeth nolan brown who wrote that cover story um i think really nailed her to the wall among other things um you know she went after um kids and their families for truancy um which is like you know We've all skipped school and none of us should be in jail for that. Um, I only did it once, but <laughs> and it was on the official skip day. So it sort of doesn't really count. Um, uh, you know, she went after people for victimless crimes, uh, drug crimes. Uh, and it's, you know, she she now has, I guess, turned over a new leaf. And maybe she thinks no one should be in jail for pot anymore. Or she thinks that Joe Biden released, I think she said, tens of thousands of people from from prison, which, you know, isn't quite right. Um, but um, isn't remotely true. I think. Yeah, that's what that's what I meant by isn't quite right. Um, uh, I always want to welcome people when they change their mind and then they agree with me. But it's she's making it really hard. <laughs> uh, Peter, you live in Washington. Um, uh, there was chatter, I don't know, five months ago, six, six months ago, when the first wave of realizations that Joe Biden is a very unpopular uh, incumbent, uh, and that maybe he ought to think of different ways to try to win the presidency. There was some chatter like, oh, you know, there's got to be a plan B somewhere here in the vice presidency. Is there any like secret plan B that's happening in Washington that I don't know about? No, there's never a secret plan B. <laughs> uh, there's never really a plan at all. There's never a plan A is often the problem. The um, uh, I think you can sum up Kamala Harris in two recent headlines. The first one was Kamala Harris is a cop. That story was, uh, as you mentioned, it was by Elizabeth Nolan Brown. But then Liz Nolan Brown wrote a follow-up story a couple of years later after Kamala Harris had been in office as vice president for several years, and we were able to assess her record. And that story was titled, Kamala Harris is a flop. And that's exactly <laughs> right. She went from cop to flop. Uh, Nick, I feel like you can rhyme something with a uh, flop and comp. I uh, I want to keep it clean, but I will <laughs> quote my own uh, 2019 uh, reason headline, and this was after she had appeared on a popular morning show where 
she had claimed uh, that during college uh, that she really liked uh, getting high and listening to Tupac and Snoop Dogg. And my headline was, Kamala, Kamala Harris got so high smoking weed in college, she thought she was listening to Snoop Dogg and Tupac. Uh, because they emerged on the scene years after she had graduated from law school, much less undergrad. Um, I do think it's great, though, regardless of her actions or lack of actions, really, and Biden, the fact that she is openly saying that nobody should be in jail for smoking weed or using weed, and eventually they'll get to selling weed or distributing weed or packaging weed. Um, it's really infuriating that they won't get to the place where they actually do pardon thousands of people or tens of thousands of people instead of about a dozen, none of whom were actually, you know, none of, none of which were simple pardons and things like that. And, you know, going back to that idea of there are a number of uh, places in, in American policy where, you know, there are, you know, 70%, 80%, even 90% super majorities who are in favor of things such as Nobody should be in jail for smoking weed. And it is excruciating that there is not a single major national politician who will actually voice that and then do something about it. So maybe when Kamala wakes up from whatever, you know, edible she's been chewing on, she'll actually, uh, you know, force Joe Biden to sign something that pardons people. Can I can I give you my favorite? Kamala quote yes, that I think please. is underappreciated. So she said this about a year ago, but it recently went viral as a TikTok sound. And I just like want you all to take a moment with that sentence before I begin. <laughs> um, and it, it, she says, everything is in context. My mother used to, she would give us a hard time sometimes and she would say to us, I don't know what's wrong with you young people. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> You exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. <laughs> <laughs> and TikTok is genuinely torn on whether this is like a deeply profound observation <laughs> or just like further evidence of her mental decline. She was talking about abortion, which... <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Anyway, and they I, just, I just want us all to ask TikTok ourselves the, you know? the question, do you think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's pretty obvious that Kamala Harris just fell out of a coconut tree. You l listen to anything that she has said. Listen to her try to describe her own positions. Just this week, uh, she said, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, we are dropping trillions of dollars on American streets right now. <laughs> I... That's okay. I mean, that's in fact kind of accurate about what the Inflation Reduction Act does. But maybe, maybe there's a, a hint in there that that act wasn't really about um, reducing inflation. But she had this problem on the campaign trail when she was running for the presidential nomination um, back in 2019 and 2020 uh, because she had co sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill in 2017. And it appears that she co sponsored that bill without having any idea what it did. So when, when she sponsored that bill, she released a statement saying, you know, this is about understanding, again, that healthcare should be a right, not a privilege, and it's also about being smart. And she says some other stuff. So it's not only about what, it is, about what is morally and ethically right, it's also, you know, it makes sense from a, a fiscal standpoint, or if you want to talk about it as a return on investment for taxpayers. So she starts running for president and people notice, hey, you were a co-sponsor of this bill. That bill is really, really insanely expensive, like even by the standards of democratic policy plans in 2019. And also there's no pay fors. So like there's no way to pay for this. They've, they've sort of gestured at a couple of things, but they never figured out how they were going to come up with $30 trillion or so. And so suddenly she starts clarifying her positions. And I use the word clarifying because that is the word, first of all, that she used, but then also that CBS News used when it published a report uh, with a headline something like, 
Kamala Harris continues to clarify her position on Medicare for all. And it's just a list of everything she said month by month throughout the campaign. And every single time, it's a different thing until she gets to the point where she says, I'm not comfortable with that bill because it would strip people of their health insurance. And also, it would cost too much, more or less. Right? Literally the opposite of the thing she said when she co-sponsored it. And so the, the Kamala Harris word salads, it's, it's, she doesn't even know what she means by um, let us uh, reflect on the vice presidency, perhaps. And since we're talking about Kamala Harris and potential red tie wearing people, um, and we're in the hometown of John Adams, I think it's time for all of us in this audience too um, to imagine and think about who is the best, or at least our favorite, vice president in American history. Catherine, I think you have an answer to this question, don't you? I do. <clears throat> I'm going to nominate William Rufus Devane King. You had to look at your notes twice. I did because I didn't hear of him. I didn't hear of him until uh, yesterday. Um, he he was Franklin. <laughs> and that's literally why you're nominating. There it is. Um, <laughs> he was Franklin Pierce's VP. Uh, wow. He was nominated uh, or he was inaugurated in uh, Cuba, where he was uh, at the time. Um, he was dead 45 days later of tuberculosis. <laughs> Leaving the office vacant for 1,416 days thereafter. Um, he, in case you're like, hey, Catherine, it's not really cool to wish people's deaths. Um, he was super pro-slavery. So, like, better off dead, honestly. <laughs> um, that's, my, that's my pick. 45 days in and out. Left the office vacant. Pretty vacant. Deserved the death. That's uh, beautiful. Uh, Nick Gillespie, who is your favorite? Or um, the best vice president? Or both? My favorite is Aaron Burr. Okay. And not I just it, because he killed Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was born in New Jersey, in Newark, which is a, a great failed city that has produced a lot of... Uh, it ha there's a Newark, Newark di a diaspora that continues to proceed apace. But as a New York, uh, New York State Assemblyman in 1785, he actually pushed anti-slavery legislation, which was pathbreaking at the time. And when he was vice president, he, he was a mess in many, many ways, but he presided over the Senate and particularly over the impeachment hearing of, uh, of uh, Justice Chase. And his fair-handedness was actually, uh, is widely understood to be one of the reasons why we have judicial independence. Um, so that's a pretty it's big like cited in Marbury versus Madison. Right? Yes. And it, I mean, it, so that's a pretty big legacy to have along with killing Hamilton. who Really? <laughs> it's annoying. He's got the best songs in Hamilton True. as well. And then the other reason, though, because he, he was a major founder, but everybody hated him. And so he, he really doesn't have anybody to carry his legacy on. And then uh, Gore Vidal um, in the early 70s wrote a, bio, a book called Burr. Uh, which is about the Watergate era and about the um, lack of confidence and trust in the American government. And he, used, he speaks through Burr, and it's just a beautiful novel that forces us to admit that even our, you know, the founders and the best people in our country are really venal, power-seeking people, and so we should always be skeptical of that. So that's what I like about Aaron Burr. Let's not also sleep on his federalism. He's a man who, after all, understood that you can't have a duel in New York because it's against the law, but it's legal in New Jersey. Well, it was actually, it was just that the penalties were less. <laughs> and he also picked the place where Hamilton's son had died in a duel. He, he, he was <laughs> doing mind games way before anybody Ray in Major League Baseball. And, yeah, and Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. This uh, is the, pres the vice presidential equivalent of moving to Florida to not pay income taxes. But with more yeah. murder. <laughs> yeah. Peter, who's your veep? You just finished telling us that you hope Tim Scott does not become the vice presidential nominee because he's a nice person and you think that it would make him bad. This is a trap. This is a trick question. I don't have a favorite vice president. He's a politician. You still have answering. to answer. No, nope. mm. no, no. Wow. wow. Listen, the, the crowd is booing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, they are now. <laughs> Manipulation it works. You got to come up with something. Yeah.
I, I'm going to let the crowd answer. Pick somebody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hannibal Hamlin. There, yeah. there you go. All right. Don't understand. Hannibal Hamlin, Hamlin uh, um, Lincoln's first fee pick. Uh, apparently, there's a, um, uh, well, well, I'll say that for, for later. Um, so I will pick uh, Nelson Rockefeller for this for a couple of reasons um, that will become more clear as time goes on here but uh one of them is because almost nobody remembers that nelson rockefeller was vice president he didn't he, he was appointed by gerald ford the only two i think vice presidents who didn't like run for office were gerald ford and nelson rockefeller because there was this whole like spear agnew problem and R watergate problem and richard nixon problem and so nelson rockefeller uh who's much better known for being named rockefeller uh, and governor of New York and Rockefeller laws and losing to Barry Goldwater, a thousand things before you think of him before you get to, oh, yeah, he's vice president for a while, um, was given no power, did nothing, was really mad about it. It didn't matter. No one cared. Um, all of that is great. He was so uh, ineffectual that they didn't bother running him for uh, re-election with Gerald Ford. Remember, it's Bob Dole ran in 1976. So like the incumbent vice president, we have some. Uh, you know, a uh, path for Kamala Harris. You don't have to necessarily renominate the guy who's the sitting vice president and all of that. And uh, what I also appreciate is something I learned only yesterday at lunch when we were workshopping uh, who I was going to talk about uh, for vice president. I didn't realize this or I'd forgotten this. Uh, maybe some of those of you who are older than me will remember this more. Oh, I but... think I know where this is going. <laughs> Nick knows where this is going. I'd, uh, three years after he left office, um, he died having sex with his assistant, um, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in like a townhouse in, uh, in Manhattan, um, uh, died. And that lead has led to a series of really fantastic jokes uh, of one of which, uh, <laughs> Tom Hazlitt mentioned to me, which is that, uh, he, uh, died of low blood, <laughs> low, low blood pressure. He was, uh, he was 70 over 25. <laughs> I'm gonna pay you that ten bucks. Yeah, <laughs> totally fine. Uh, New York Magazine said uh, he thought he was coming, but he was actually going. <laughs> um, uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently, it got to the point where Johnny Carson. This is like very similar to what I remember more. Um, uh, like at some point, you could just sort of say Bill Clinton. Uh, if you're a late night comic and everyone would just laugh, um, uh, but he would uh, he would say the name of the poor woman who was uh, with Nelson Rockefeller when he died. Her, her name was not Morgan Spurlock. It was uh, Megan Marshak. Megan Marshak. Yeah. <laughs> that brain contains everything in it. Every I useless fact. I love the way you looked fact. right at him. You were That's, like, I don't even yeah. question that he has this answer. No, he's no. got it. He's got it there. But like uh, Johnny Carson would mention her name and the crowd burst out laughing. So Nelson Rockefeller, um, R.I.P. Um, <laughs> let's go to our end of podcast what we uh, consume culturally here we'll do it as we generally tend to do at reason weekends and at live shows in various far-flung locales and do a local tie-in and maybe uh that local tie-in was even influenced by walking tours today or maybe not who knows uh, who's to say uh, but we can all maybe reflect on it ourselves which is to say which piece of culture emanating from or sort of evincing, I don't know what that word means, uh, Boston, that feels like Boston, comes from Boston, has mass holes involved in some way. What is your favorite, the one that is most meaningful to you? I'm going to start with Doctor of Literature, Nicholas. Uh, thank you, Matt. I was going to go with the Standell's Dirty Water, which oh, is, yeah. the Dirty Water is about the Charles River and about the uh, various Nelson Rockefellerian assignations that used to happen there in the mid 60s next to that dirty water which people love but i'm actually uh i was thinking about this and i uh have picked the uh, 2015 movie spotlight which won the best movie picture as well as best original screenplay oscar and um this is a movie that is about the boston globe's expose of the catholic church uh, priest uh, sexual abuse scandal in Boston, and it's an excellent movie. Uh, you know, we started this weekend with Matt talking about media and kind of the death of a certain type of, me uh, of newspaper uh, media and things like that. And this reminds us that there are times when, you know, legacy media really do great work. 
And if you think about a town like Boston, which is very Catholic, and the Catholic Church was held in very high regard here, the hierarchy, and they abuse that trust quite openly and brutally and for a long period of time, which this movie makes clear. And it's an excellent exploration of, you know, where does power reside and how do you check power and how that is done through skepticism, but also checking facts and getting things right and then bringing it to light. So that to me, uh, and I say this also as a native New Yorker who really hates Boston, it exemplifies everything about Boston. <laughs> yes. uh, Peter? So I was really tempted to just answer that my favorite piece of Boston-themed pop culture was just America. But uh, like the whole thing, right? You walk around Boston and it's like, oh, um, uh, the whole country is just kind of a Boston-themed theme park. But in fact, there's, there's a version of this that exists in the digital world. And so my actual answer is a video game. It's a game called Fallout 4. And then Fallout 4 is a... Uh, Quick a, show of hands. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody here know? Okay, so if go. you've seen, there is now an Amazon television show that is based on this video game franchise. The television show was set in Los Angeles, but the, the game series has been going on for several decades. And the, the, the best of the games are these vast... Uh, offer these vast explorable territories. So one of them is set in Washington, D.C., one of them is set in Las Vegas, and one of them is set in a post-apocalyptic, bombed out, um, sort of de-industrialized, de-civilized version of Boston, which is called the Commonwealth. And it is a great, funny, dark satire of a fractured America that is filled with twisted Americana. So when you wake up, the first thing you do is you join up with a group called the Minutemen, which is trying to reinvigorate the American ideals in this uh, sort of broken wasteland that has, been, that has been destroyed by bombs and is filled with super mutants and raiders. But then you meet other factions as well. You meet uh, you meet the Brotherhood of Steel, who are this sort of warlike guys in, in, in power armor. You meet a, a group that has devoted themselves to ending the slavery of robots. And then you meet a group called the Institute, which of course is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, though they never quite use that, that, uh, world, that word. Um, uh, but the, the Institute is devoted to rebuilding America along the lines of sort of scientific progress and revitalizing that. But that means that maybe we need robot slavery in order to get there. And so you have to choose which faction you're going to ally with. But as part of this, you get to explore this world. And what you get to see is that there are competing ideologies throughout this. And in some ways, it, exploring this world reminds me of what we heard at our lunch talk today, where Charles Mann talked about the world of, of, of America before it was settled um, by the Europeans, where you had all of these Native American tribes, and they all had different worldviews and different ideologies. And you might have the nicest, you know, sort of most trade-friendly group living right next door to a bunch of horrible slavers. And that's what this video game is like. And you just get to kind of bum around a futuristic Boston and see the, see the great expanse of, um, uh, of, of America and of, of the American people, well, of the future American people after things have been destroyed. And so the game is a kind of a, a meditation on what happens in a world where civilization and governmental structures that we take for granted and know incredibly well and just sort of assume will always be there, what happens when they're gone? And the answer is, well, different people will have different ideas about how the world should look, and they will fight with each other, and they will compete for resources. And you, as an individual, will have to make choices about which, which faction you want to join and how you're going to be part of it. Catherine, wake up. Um, <laughs> I'm here. I'm ready. Which uh, Boston record uh, is third coming? I don't even know what that means. I know. It's... <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, I lived for Boston. I lived in Boston for uh, two years. Uh, it was not my favorite uh, time. The city is cold and grumpy, as far as I can tell. Um, but uh, the two years were redeemed by the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, which. Uh, truly, I think, is one of the best museums in the country. Um, it is great, uh, not only because it has a fantastic collection, but also because it has a, a super weird story. Um, and uh, there are actually two super weird stories. One is the way that it was founded. Isabella Stewart Gardner seems like she was a real spicy lady. 
Um, and you can see some paintings of her in the museum, including one by John Singer Sargent uh, that's called Mrs. Gardner in White. And it's this very beautiful, odd painting of her kind of swathed in fabric. Um, her husband died. She filled up this museum with, like, I think she just filled her purse with antiquities when she went to Italy and then just, like, unloaded them when she got home in the courtyard. There are just little bits and pieces that, like, we would not be allowed to do that these days. She just she just pinched whatever she liked. She acquired uh, a bunch of art um, and um, and built this beautiful museum. Um, she established it in such a way in her will that basically nothing can be changed about it. And so this museum is therefore safe from the sort of increasingly stupid curatorial trends uh, that result in the over explaining and the over diversifying and the kind of homogenization of so many museums. This museum is about this weird gal and stuff that she liked. And I like it too. Um, there was also a famous art heist, uh, which is unsolved to this day. So you can go and like Nancy drew out if you want to kind of go try to figure it out. Um, it's delightful. It has a very nice little cafe and, uh, and I can't recommend it enough. The Isabella Stewart Gardner museum, the only thing that's good about Boston. <laughs> wow. I thought I was going to be the anti-Boston person here. So uh, my choice, Jim Epstein, uh, it, as we wind down our non-question and answer part of this uh, podcast uh, taping, um, I'm from Los Angeles or from Los Angeles County, California, Long Beach, California, Southern California, uh, and a sports fan. Um, so, uh, my feeling of Boston, uh, is not intrinsically positive, uh, I think is a way of putting this. Um, and so the, um, Boston related piece of culture that I enjoy the most is HBO's winning time, which is about the rise of the dynasty, Los Angeles Lakers with magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and et cetera. Boo. What? <laughs> You know, Kareem and I have a have a rivalry that's entirely that, one sided. That is true. This time, though, uh, Catherine. So I'll just explain because it's great. Uh, Catherine has been nominated seventy five years in a row for the best <laughs> columnist of the year and the L.A. Press Club Awards, the Greater Southern California uh, Press Association Awards um, for best columnist, and she's been against Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Uh, former uh, Lakers center and also an author of several interesting books and has a very good Substack. And every year, Catherine loses to him. Um, this year, he's not nominated. She is, uh, but now she's up against Gustavo Ariano, a recent yeah. contributor. And I'm going to lose again. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Winning Time is great. It's one of my three favorite television series of the past 20 years, along with Deadwood and something else that I'm forgetting because I'm getting too old. Um, uh, Thanks, Rick Perry. <laughs> listen, it's yeah, that Rick Perry. You forgot uh, the third thing. TV <laughs> movie. It's fine. Um, uh, uh, no, it's just uh, it's remarkable. Uh, Adrian Brody is uh, Pat Riley. Um, uh, it's a kind of thing that you can look at that in and having no interest at all in uh, in basketball uh, in even sporting competition. There's a weird, uh, interesting kind of uh, feminist sub theme, which doesn't make sense because it's all at the Playboy Mansion. It's just a remarkable uh, piece of art that was truncated. Uh, and so Boston fans should love this because it, it was supposed to go at least three seasons and it went two. And at the end of season two was when the Lakers get humiliated by Larry Bird's Boston Celtics. And then suddenly, because they didn't renew the season, like, oh, sorry, we're over. Um, so we didn't get to see them reach the promised land. But it was actually the depictions, particularly of Larry Bird uh, and also of Red Auerbach, but really of Larry Bird. Um, all, all this is based on uh, mostly true stories. Um, that made grumpy 55 year old me have some grudging respect for these people that I've hated for so long. And, uh, and, uh, and also like just the sort of mimetic rivalry between, uh, two people and magic and bird very famously became great friends after spending their entire lives in locked in mortal combat. But it's a terrific series. I can't recommend it highly enough. And I think Jim Epstein has had enough time to reposition his camera. So I want to say thank you all for listening, sitting through all of this. And then now ask us questions, which we will then edit out brutally. Is it on? Yes. All right. Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers, I think. Yeah. Very good. That's a great thing about Boston. And 
the Pajama Slave Dancers, if, any, if anybody knows them. Great band. Not Pixies. well remembered. <laughs> um, since this episode has been sort of Veep-centric, I'm curious about your opinion about Kelsey Gabbard and whether... Tulsi, Tulsi Gabbard and whether you think uh, that might make sense and whether she would join a Trump ticket. Catherine, you're a lady. Catherine, you're a lady. <laughs> Are you just Catherine, you're a lady in yourself? Yeah, now? I did. Well, he did it with his eyes. It was you, could, you couldn't see, but he did. Um, Tulsi has been good to reason in that uh, when she uh, has appeared on various debate stages, uh, any headline that contains her name on our website does excellent traffic. So there's something there. There's something about Tulsi Gabbard that calls out to a certain type of person who is checking out Reason.com during a presidential debate. Um, I guess I kind of see it. She's an interesting character. Um, I commend to you, if you have not read it, the uh, Carrie Howley New York Magazine profile of Tulsi Gabbard, with, which both asks and answers and then asks again a lot of questions about what her deal is. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything about how politics works, so I can't tell you whether she will be the vice presidential nominee that Donald Trump might select. But if he does, it, it will encourage all the women of the nation to elevate their hair game. That is true. <laughs> The skunk I, stripe is baller. It's I so good. I think she's, uh, I think he doesn't mind erraticness uh, and unpredictability, certainly. But hers has not been uh, like sort of safely in concert in the Republican Party. She hasn't been bending in that direction towards his direction for a long time. So it's hard to imagine like calling that audible in 2024. If he'd been grooming her in that way for a couple of years or she'd been grooming herself, which is the more likely scenario, then you could see it happening. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't see it happening. I don't think uh, she, you know, Ivanka Trump probably has the front runner slot in that. <laughs> it's not too soon, apparently. Uh, more questions? In the late 1990s, the first time I told a friend that I considered myself libertarian, she looked at me and said, Andy, how can that be? Lyndon LaRouche is a libertarian. Fortunately, over the next 25 years, the work of Reason, the Cato Institute, Institute for Justice, it made me feel that libertarianism was now mainstream. And yet, over the last year, I feel the Libertarian Party has bring, brought me back to the days of Lyndon LaRouche. And I'm now defensive about it, and I resent it. How do you all feel about it? I mean, do you, do, do you feel defensive now? Do you have to explain that you're libertarian, but you're not part of the Libertarian Party? And, how do you deal with that? Catherine, you're a lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I mean, I'll do it. Um, I have described myself for a long time as a small L libertarian, not a big L libertarian. Um, I think the Libertarian Party has had better and worse moments. I think it's in one of its worst moments right now. Um, and uh, I think that the coming a uh, libertarian national convention which is going to be a couple blocks from reasons dc office um will be quite an interesting spectacle as libertarian national conventions often are but this one will have the twist of having one or one and a half um of the major party i don't even know how to describe uh, what rfk jr is doing these days uh, trump's going to be there and maybe rfk jr too um and um, I, I certainly agree with you that the current iteration of the Libertarian Party has made it a lot harder for me to describe what I think libertarianism is because I don't recognize what they are doing as my variant at this time. I would add that, um, you know, as someone who uh, like allowed for myself to be described as a libertarian, even after I had started working for a reason, just because I'm a jerk um, uh, and like precious. Um, somehow, be maybe because of that, I don't feel defensive about the term. I don't feel like I was wearing Bob Barr and Michael Bednarik, uh, particularly, and had to like answer for Wayne Allen Root's sins. Um, uh, and we we do journalism, and that puts us at odds oftentimes with whoever's managing the Libertarian Party. This is actually a classic story in the history of Reason. You know, like uh, 
Libertarian Party starts in 1971, three years after Reason starts, and we have to decide, by we I mean the person sitting right in front of you, uh, has to decide, like, uh, you know, we should cover this as it's as it's going. Should we spin it off as a newsletter? Or should we cover it too much? And like, there's almost no thanks in covering the, the Libertarian Party uh, internal struggles because everyone feels them very deeply and passionately. And um, Reason, uh, because it is an institution that has survived and has heft an audience and i think some uh, level of seriousness is just there you have to like deal with us if you're uh, dealing in planet libertarian um it's easy for people to then try to sort of like position themselves kind of against us like try to make us part of the story um so um i don't uh, that's a, a a coverage challenge um uh that i don't think is at all insurmountable or difficult it's just kind of interesting in a year like this in particular um, but I have never felt like whatever they're doing is, um, if you're confident in yourself, you don't really have to worry about what the rest of the world, um, it thinks of you uh, is the way I've kind of looked at this. Um, and there's always going to be, I mean, if you are in a, a group that is on the margins of politics or of society or anything, there's going to be a lot of marginal people and you are probably one of them. And I definitely <laughs> am. Um, so there's going to be a higher variance of odd behavior and off-putting behavior. So you just, uh, yeah, I, it, it can be, it can feel challenging at times, but it's also like, it's what a, it's a, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I think is the way, it's the way, I, no, seriously, like the way I look at it, there's going to be some people who call themselves libertarian who act really weird. Um, and there always is, and I'm not going to use that as an excuse to change my own self terminology. The courting of Trump has been really frustrating and really disappointing with the, you know, with what's going on with a convention where it's not just asking him to speak, which is one thing, but also the merchandise that was displayed, which may or may not ever be for sale, but is a kind of um, Trump booster, you know, sort of a shirts, you know, su suggesting all the things that Trump might do that libertarians want him to do if he wins office uh, again, that he didn't do when he had a chance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's disappointing in a bunch of ways, one of which is that libertarianism should be distinct from the Republican Party. But by that same token, the idea of libertarianism, lowercase l libertarianism, libertarian is a libertarianism is a conceptual framework, not a political party. And I've always felt like it's a mistake, regardless of your outlook and your ideology, but especially if you are someone sort of who isn't part of the mainstream duopoly, it's always a little bit of a mistake to, to go all in on a political party because political parties and politicians will always disappoint you. I don't do political parties, I do cocktail parties. Hmm. Uh, just uh, real quickly, you know, uh, Reason's motto for decades has been free minds and free markets, and I would love for there to be a major political party that reflected those beliefs. And uh, Right now, it does not seem like that's the Libertarian Party, and it's certainly not the Republican or Democratic Party, but that might change over time. And it was, you know, I found it genuinely exciting uh, when Ron Paul was running for president as a Republican. Uh, his Libertarian candidacy in 1988 wasn't as uh, quite enthralling, uh, but those ideas were really good, the ones he was espousing on the trail. And I thought Gary Johnson was a very effective communicator, uh, you know, obviously limited in reach and things like that. But I think if the, the if the LP finally decides that it is a political party whose job is to find candidates that are electable and get them into office, I think they could be very successful, especially if they follow a kind of basic free minds and free markets platform. That's what a lot of people in the country want. And there is absolutely nowhere else to go. So hopefully they'll come to that realization. All right. Well, let's give it up for the Reason Roundtable. Table.